Hello friends and welcome to this week's episode of Grits in the Gospel. It is the 22nd Sunday after Pentecost uh, and we are coming together in worship on these beautiful October Sundays before we wind down the end of the liturgical year and begin a new one in Advent. Let us come together today in a posture of worship. The Lord be with you and also with you. Today's epistle lesson comes from the book of Hebrews chapter 5 verses 1 through 10. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with them with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also, Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was not heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, He learned obedience through what he was suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Having been designated by God a high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us come together now and uh, remind ourselves of the things that we believe as people of faith. Friends, what do we believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray together. Dear Lord, as we come together today, let us hear and receive your word. Let us open our hearts and minds to the message that you have given. Let us go out into the world and be Christ-like in all we do. Let it start now with the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. In her Vanity Fair article, Hadley Hall Mears looks at the sibling rivalry that occurred between the Hollywood starlet sisters, Olivia de Havilland and Joan Fontaine. Here are a couple of excerpts from the article that show how these sisters 
lived a life of competition and attention-seeking behaviors. I regret that I remember not one act of kindness from Olivia all through my childhood. Movie star Joan Fontaine once said of her equally famous older sister, Olivia de Havilland. De Havilland begged to differ. I love her so much as a child, she told Vanity Fair in 2016. Throughout their long lives, they seemed to disagree with each other about almost everything, making theirs one of the few Hollywood feuds which truly lived up to the hype. Each woman's resume was impressive. Fontaine was the Oscar-winning star of films including Rebecca, Suspicion, and The Women. De Havilland won two Oscars to her sister's one, gracing the screen in movies as varied as Gone with the Wind, The Adventures of Robin Hood, The Snake Pit, and The Heiress. Both sisters were steely brave and talented know-it-alls, determined to have the last word. After Fontaine's death in 2013, the claws came out. Dragon Lady, as she referred to Fontaine, was a brilliant, multi-talented person with astigmatism in her perception of people and events, which often caused her to react in an unfair and even injurious way. Indeed, Fontaine even made a competition of their impending mortality, spilling their sibling rivalry into the afterlife. I married first, won the Oscar before Olivia did, Fontaine said in 1978, and if I die first, she'll undoubtedly be livid because I beat her to it. From birth, Fontaine writes in her biography, No Bed of Roses, We were not encouraged by our parents or nurses to be anything but rivals. Within this stressful, competitive hothouse, Fontaine claims that the perfectionist de Havilland, her mother's clear favorite, bullied her timid sister. At nine, for a school assignment, Olivia was reportedly assigned a pretend last will. I bequeath all of my beauty to my younger sister Joan, she allegedly wrote, since she has none. In No Bed of Roses, Fontaine claims that she was spurred to write her autobiography after de Havilland hijacked their mother's 1975 funeral. According to Fontaine, de Havilland attempted to block her from attending, only changing the date after Fontaine threatened to go to the press. After the service, the two sisters did not speak. She scattered a handful of ashes, then silently passed the container to me, she writes. Thus, I said goodbye forever to my mother. As for Olivia, I had no words at all. They would allegedly never speak again, but it was de Havilland who got the last word. After Fontaine's death, she finally became liberated to tell her side of the story, saying of their relationship, On my part, it was always loving, but sometimes estranged, and in later years, severed. When asked if she would have talked to her sister if she was still alive, she was defiant. If the dragon lady were alive today, out of self-protection, I would maintain my silence. Let us now move to scripture as we look at today's gospel lesson. and the gospel according to Mark, we are in the 10th chapter, verses 35 through 45. Hear now the word of the Lord. James and John, the son of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do this for us whenever we ask you. And he said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Appoint us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? Then he replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, that I drink, you will drink, and with the baptism with ye, with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. 
But to sit at my right hand and or at my left is not mine to appoint. But it is for those whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers, lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Dear Lord, as we come together today, let us be grateful for those who are close to us in ministry and let us learn to work together and set aside any ego and um, need for affirmation that we have so that we can serve others better. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I am very competitive. We grew up in my family playing a lot of cards and board games. I was never allowed to win. I had to earn it. That competitive nature is most seen in different forms of sibling rivalries. I have only one blood brother and we're definitely competitive. When I learned to slalom at Lake Sinclair, it took him all 24 hours to learn to do it himself. He did not want his sister knowing how to do something that he didn't. When we play hearts and spades, I still don't know that secret formula he uses to calculate his bets on the number of hands he can win. It's rare that I can beat him. But it's not just with blood relatives. I have many friends that are like siblings, and I get just as competitive with them. My friend Becky is more like a sister than a friend. And when I play any game with her, I don't care who in the family wins as long as I beat her. Because nothing gets under her skin more than losing to me. It may be the slight taunting that helps that along, but that's what makes it fun for me. When I lived in Megan, every Tuesday night, a group of us came together to play social solitaire. That group of people loves and cares for and prays for and feeds each other in body and spirit. But as soon as we start playing social solitaire, the elbows start flying and we call each other names that would make our grandmothers blush. But as soon as it's over, we hug and love on each other as we go back home. Competition is not bad at its heart. It can push us to be better. It can be a time of fellowship and laughter. It can build close bonds, as counterintuitive as that sounds. But just like anything in life, it can be taken too far. Everything in moderation, we like to say. The de Havilland sisters could have used a dose of humility and sibling love to go along with that sibling rivalry. But that is something that was ingrained in them from the beginning of life. It's hard to break away from the need for attention and to be the favored one when their parents and even nurses were encouraging it. It poisoned their relationship until the end of both of their lives. The seeds of hate that were planted early were hard not to sow. Mark 10 shows Jesus pulling up those same seeds of hatred and jealousy that those sons of Zebedee James and John were sowing. He is quick to see what they were doing and put a stop to it. I don't quote the message often. It's not a translation like the one we read each week. It does not come directly from the original languages of Scripture. I think it's a valuable tool that we can use to see Scripture brought to life in a different way. If we keep that in mind, the text is almost like a movie that the de Havilland sisters might be a part of. 
James and John, Zebedee's sons, came to him. Teacher, we have something we want you to do for us. What is it? I'll see what I can do. Arrange it, they said, so that we will be awarded the highest places of honor in your glory. One of us at your right, the other at your left. Jesus said, you have no idea what you're asking. Are you capable of drinking the cup I drink? Of being baptized in the baptism I'm about to be plunged into? Sure, they said, why not? Jesus said, come to think of it, I will drink the you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized in my baptism. But as to awarding places of honor, that's not my business. There are other arrangements for that. Those ego-driven brothers, how bold of them to walk right up to the Savior of the world, their teacher, their leader, the one who has now said more than once that the first shall be last and the last shall be first, and they ask for special consideration in the kingdom of God. That took guts. That took chutzpah. That would get you the side eye at the card table with Becky and an elbow thrown at the Tuesday card table. The message interpretation gives us a similar picture of what the other ten disciples thought about them asking for favor and trying to outmaneuver them for top dog status. When the other ten heard this conversation, they lost their tempers with James and John. Lost their tempers? I wonder what that looked like. I have a feeling there were some choice words spoken among them. I wonder if there were any moments of pushing and shoving. I wonder if that childlike faith that we saw last week was also manifested in childlike behavior of settling a brotherly score. Those men had to have become like family. I know what it's like to travel with the same group of people for work. Those bonds are very strong. Those people become your people. You know their quirks. You know their hurts and hopes. You know what can really push their buttons. Not that I ever did that when I was traveling for work with my friends. So this ask that James and John made had to have been very hurtful. They're supposed to be a team. A group of disciples coming together to change the world. And here were these two brothers asking for special favors. No wonder they lost their tempers. Probably would have thrown an elbow myself. This next passage in the message uh, is taking a little more poetic license. I think the interpretation is very timely and very truthful, but let's make sure we keep in mind that this is not a translation for these particular um, verses. Jesus got them together to settle things down. You observed how godless rulers throw their weight around, he said, and when people get a little power, how quickly it goes to their heads. It's not going to be that way with you. Jesus is protecting them from themselves. He is making sure that their egos remain in check. He is reflecting back to them what their behavior looks like before he reminds them of how they should be living. Have you ever had that happen before? Have you ever been in a situation that doesn't seem so bad to you, but then you tell someone about it and say something like, well, now that I say that out loud, it sounds worse than I thought. That is the gift that Jesus is trying to give these brothers. He's saying to them, brothers, you're starting to act like the thing you don't like to see in others. And I'm not going to let you do that. And then Jesus brings it home. And for the third time in two chapters, he says this. Whoever wants to be great must become a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. That is what the Son of Man has done. He came to serve, not to be served. And then to give away his life in exchange for many who are held hostage. 
Friends, I said it last week. When Jesus repeats himself, I listen. And now we've heard it thrice. <laughs> we heard it first when he was settling an argument with the disciples about who was the greatest among them. Chapter 9, 35 says, He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Then in chapter 10, we see him reminding us of what it means to be a follower of God. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. And now in today's scripture, he makes it even more explicit. Chapter 10, verses, verse 43 says, But it is not so among you. Instead, whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. All of these things were said to the disciples, not the crowds. He was telling those who were already part of his brotherhood, his first group of church leaders, his future messengers of the good news, that they could not make this thing about themselves. For those of us in the church, the message is clear. We are not to put ourselves first. We are not to worry about who is the greatest and most holy and most powerful. We are not to fret about who will sit where in heaven. We have to get there first. And the way to do that is to first believe and then go out and put those in need ahead of our own needs. We are called to set aside what we want and need and make sure others are cared for. Jesus is not asking them to do anything he wasn't willing to do himself. They may not have realized it at the time. He said those words in verse 45. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. He would show them throughout his ministry. He would show them at the Last Supper when he bent down and washed their feet. And he would show them on the cross as he put all of mankind first in his greatest act of servanthood. There's nothing wrong with being a little competitive, or at least that's what I tell myself. It does feed my ego a little. I like winning. I like feeling like I've accomplished something. I like being pushed to be better and have stronger skills in different areas. Also have lots of other ways to keep my ego in check. The balance is a healthy one. It's not always the case. I still want to know how my little brother calculates his bet and cards. Becky and I have had our bumps on the road of sisterhood, but when the chips are down and the cards are down, I can always count on her. My Tuesday card friends may have been brutal with my ego while we played, but they have held my heart close when I needed it most. I'm sure the disciples did the same. They had their ego check from James and John and a little temper flare up for themselves, but they worked through it. And I'm sure that they were a stronger group. I wish the de Havilland sisters had been able to do the same. It's a cautionary tale for us all. When we let our competitive selves and our egos get in the way of real relationship, siblings or otherwise, we're not able to do good work together for the kingdom. As we move forward as a church, I hope that we can do just that. Set aside what we may want for ourselves and start to ask how we can be a servant to others. Jesus said it at least three times. I think we should pay attention. Amen. As we go throughout our week, let us find ways to be the servant of others. To serve and not to be served, just as Jesus did. Because in life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.